Okay, let me ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms. Psalm 42, if you will, please. Psalm 42. And I'm going to read the entire psalm, so you follow along as I read. As the heart, that's an old English word for a deer. As the heart panted after the water books, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, and from the Hermonites, and from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me in my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, and verse 14, the prophet Elijah is caught up to heaven by a fiery whirlwind, and um, just before he was taken up, he told his disciple Elisha that if he should see him go up into heaven, then a double portion of God's spirit would come upon Elisha, and he would then begin to prophesy in the place of Elijah. And uh, as he saw him ascending up, Elijah's mantle, the prayer shawl on his head, fell to the ground, and Elisha picked it up. And he was left all alone there in the wilderness. And he cried, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he takes that mantle and he smites it into the river Jordan and the waters part. Elisha goes back across where he had come from and it was clear that God was now with him. God let him know that he was now the prophet of Israel and concerning the double portion someone had pointed out to me years ago that Elisha was responsible for twice as many miracles as Elijah had been during his ministry. The most interesting miracle, at least to my thinking, was when they were letting down the body of a dead man into a, a tomb, probably something hollowed out for more than one person to be buried in, and uh, the dead man's bones touched the dead body of Elisha in the grave, and it caused that man to come back to life again. <laughs> Woo! That doesn't happen every day. I work a day job in the funeral business. I've never seen it happen yet. <laughs> but uh, sometimes, although, although it, it, it seems that God is distant from us, we want to ask, where is God? Why does he seem so far away when I need him the most? And David said that his enemies provoked him by asking, where is thy God? There in verse 3 and verse 10. God seemed to him to have forgotten about him. Verse 9 would have it. He said that he even went with a multitude of others to the house of God. There in verse 4. And when they were singing with joy and praise, he says his own soul was cast down and disquieted within him. Verse 5. 
If you're a believer, you still want to be reminded that God has not forsaken you when you have troubles and problems uh, that come to you in life. Take, for example, the, the story of Job. Here, Job is, is covered with sore boils from head to toe. He's lost his children. He's lost his servants. He's lost all of his possessions because of uh, invading enemies and natural disasters God allowed to come. Everything's wiped out. And he's got an angry wife uh, who, who's rebelling against uh, Job's God and says, Why dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. And Job tells her, Job 2, verse 10, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? The Bible says, In all this did not Job sin with his lips. You know, if you're going through some major problem in life, some heartbreaking disappointment, it doesn't mean God has forgotten you. It might be proof that he hasn't forgotten about you. He lets you endure something, to suffer something, go through some very difficult hardship because he knows it's going to make you stronger on the other side after it's all over with. Job later said, Job 23 verse 10, uh, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He resolved to make the best of it. Uh, Bob Jones Sr. would say, don't ask God for a light burden. Ask him for strong shoulders to carry a heavy burden. But Elijah thought he was all alone. And the, the, the whole world had forsaken God. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we read that great story on Mount Carmel where Elijah and the prophets of Baal build respective altars and they call upon their respective gods to see which one would send fire down from heaven and burn up their offering. And uh, the, the men of Baal, they prayed from morning till midday and calling on, on Baal and cutting themselves and, and uh, uh, punishing themselves with flesh, hoping to gain the attention of their God and nothing happened. And Elijah tells his servants, Cover that altar with water, pour water all over it, dig a trench about it so the trench is filled with water. Don't do it once, don't do it twice, do it three times. That thing was drenched with water. And of course, he's adding insult to their injury because you know how water generally puts out fire, not the other way around. And uh, he calls upon the Lord God and God sends down fire and it burns up all of Elijah's uh, offering. And it was clear who the true Lord God was. And the other prophets of Baal are saying, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Too little, too late. Elijah tells his servants, Go cut their heads off. They decapitated 400 prophets of Baal that day. And uh, the prophets of Baal, who Queen Jezebel was partial to, got her upset. And I'm paraphrasing, but in chapter 19, she effectively says, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you if it's the last thing I do. And suddenly, Elijah's got the idea, he's come to the resolve, the decision that he's all alone. Nobody else follows the Lord God like he does. And uh, I don't know why it is, but after every mountaintop experience, some great blessing with God, something God does for you that brings joy to your heart and happiness into your soul and gives you a new song to sing and some reason to be excited about living for Christ, right after some great experience, you're going to go through a valley of discouragement. Some problem's going to come that you weren't expecting. There's always a problem right after a blessing. I don't know. Who knows why that is? But it happens. Just as sure as night follows day and day follows night, there's going to be a trial following a great blessing. Go up to summer camp and always the common theme in summer camp if you're up in the mountains is uh, this is a mountaintop experience. Now you got to go back down the bottom of the hill where you live and see if you can still live for Christ down there. And it'll happen to you kids. You go to camp this year. You'll get a great blessing here, great preaching. You'll learn some scripture and you'll have a wonderful time. And as soon as you go back home, you're going to be faced with the same 
problems, the same dumb, lame, stupid friends at school or at work are going to be there waiting for you. Let's see if that blessing carries over into the following week. It always seems to be that way. And uh, Elijah he chops the heads of 400 false prophets off, and God won a great victory that day. And then no sooner did that happen, then Jezebel says, I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. And now he's discouraged and depressed, wondering what's happening. It always happens that way. And uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, but, but, but God let Elijah know, and we read about later, he said to Elijah, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. We read about Romans 11, verse 4. But Elijah was unaware of those men. He didn't know who they were or where they were at. So it might seem like you're all alone at times and nobody else wants to live for God or love God or serve God like you think you do. But uh, don't think of, the Bible says uh, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think there in Romans 12. So don't think you're the only one. God's got saints and Christians who love him that you and I will never know about and we'll never meet them until we get to heaven. But the Apostle Paul learned where to find comfort and hope from God in, in troublous times. He writes, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Romans 10, verse 4. So it's from the written words of God that we find help, that we find answers to life's great uh, mysteries. If you're feeling like some lonely Christian... Uh, even though you know you shouldn't. Let me answer the question for you today. Where is thy God? Where is thy God? And, uh, you know, the unbelieving world, the, the, the skeptical, the agnostic, the atheistic world, I mentioned this recently. Let me run through it again. Every atheist will pose these questions in some form or another. They've got nothing new to offer. And they raise these same objections, and they think they're clever uh, in doing so, they think they're the first one to ever hit upon these arguments. But these arguments have been written down uh, and repeated by atheists for many generations. They'll say, you Christians, uh, specifically Christians, you say you believe in a God that's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. There's nothing he cannot do. And you say you believe in a God who is omniscient. He knows and he sees everything taking place in the universe. And you say you also believe in a God that's a God of love. He wants to give blessings to his creatures. If those things are true, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why are so, there so much devastation and people's uh, uh, torture and persecution and meanness to other people? Why do so many people suffer uh, tragedies in this life? Why are there so many problems that one person visits upon another person if your God's a God of love? Why doesn't he stop that from happening? Now, either he can stop it, he has all power to stop it, but he chooses not to, then they say God's indifferent. He doesn't care. Maybe your God's not really able to stop everything. Maybe he doesn't have all power. So he's not the God you say you believe in. Maybe God's able to stop problems. Maybe he knows he's, had, he's got the power to stop any tragedy from happening, but he's not aware of it. He, something happened somewhere in the world that he didn't know about. No one told him about. So he may be all-powerful, but he's not all-knowing. Well, maybe your God has the power to stop suffering, and he knows about the suffering, uh, but he chooses not to. Therefore, he's not all-loving. How can you believe in a God whose identity seems to be fall apart with a simple argument like that? And they think by... An argument like that, they've disproved the very existence of God. You cannot say God doesn't exist. The loving God of Christians isn't even there. And he's responsible for all the problems in the world. You see the contradiction in that? You, you can't find character flaws in someone if they're not there. And yet this is the argument the atheist makes all the time. You don't want to be a Christian that says, where is God? Why does God let this happen? Why does God allow this suffering, this problem to come to me? Why couldn't he, like Tevia and Fiddler on the Roof, God, why don't you choose somebody else one, once in a while, you know? Choose somebody else instead of choosing the Jew. 
Let me run through a number of answers to the question, where is thy God? And I'll give you the scripture references rather than have you, we're not going to turn to them all and read them all. That's tedious and, and boring. Nothing's more boring than having a guy speak, all right, now turn over to verse so-and-so. And I mean, listen, for the sake of video, for the sake of, of brevity and uh, our video ministry, I'll have you write the scriptures down from each point. You can go home and look them up later, but I'll just read them and we'll move on. I, I guess I'm, I'm to the point now where I prefer to just say what needs to be said, get to the point, and, and wrap it up. I don't have the patience to listen to a 55-minute sermon by some preachers. Maybe they've just got more material to, to offer than I have, but be that as it is, I'd rather just get to the point, say what I want to say, make the point, and uh, see what God does with it. But point number one, Deuteronomy 4, verse 39, says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God, in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Where is thy God? First of all, God is above you. You know, from, a high, from high above, you have a much better vantage point to see things taking place down below. Uh, at a football stadium or a baseball stadium, usually the broadcaster is in a uh, broadcasting booth halfway up the, the height of the grandstand so he can see all the action on the field taking place uh, in front of him. I want you to imagine yourself on a timeline. One, uh, one end is eternity past, the opposite end is eternity future. And your life is one small little sliver on that timeline. You don't know everything that's transpired before you came along, and you certainly don't know what's going to happen after your life is over. But God, by definition, the God of the Bible, is outside of time and space. He made that, so he's not bound by it. And he sees all of eternity simultaneously. He sees your life and the life of everyone else who's ever lived. He knows what's happened in the past, and he knows what's going to happen in the future. And so from his perspective, he sees things that you don't see. He sees it much better and more clearly than you could possibly see it. So you have to think if God's above me, he's got a better view of my life and what's in store for me, even if I don't see it at the moment. You have to trust God that way. You have to have some measure of trust that God's smarter than I am. And he knows what's taking place. He knows what happened before. He knows what's going to happen to me tomorrow. If I should live till tomorrow, and he sees it all at the same time. So he's in a better, in a better position to see what's going on and then to watch out for you. Secondly, let me say this. Psalm 125, verse 2, tells us, As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. Where is thy God? Secondly, God is around you. Lord God, uh, round about Israel, has protected that people for thousands of years. You cannot say God is not involved, or God didn't have anything to do with it, to keep the identity of the Jew intact for 2,000 years without a country to call their own, without a homeland, without a national state, without a flag to fly, without an army to protect themselves, scattered from pillar to post and spread out in every country of the world. But not only does the Jew's identity survive, the Jew's language survives. The survival of the Hebrew language is a miracle of God in and of itself. After Elijah was gone and Elisha began to prophesy to the nation of Israel, soon it became his turn to pass the faith on to another young man, one of his own disciples. We read in 2 Kings 6, verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see in the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. But it takes the eyes of faith to see and believe that when you're faced with difficulties that seem insurmountable, that God is around you on every side watching out for you, you have to think that God has your best interests at heart, whether you can see it right away or not. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, a Christian and God always make a majority in any community. That's a good way of putting it. 
But God is above you and God is around you. Thirdly, let me say this. Exodus 13, verse 21 states, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. You know, problems happen 24-7. Problems don't just happen between 8 and 5, Monday through Friday. Problems happen any time of the day or night, 365, 24-7. Where is thy God? He is before you. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10, verse 27. We sing, Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. And yet, you know, when some of, someone asks us to follow them down some dangerous road, you kind of ask, you hesitate and ask, Are you sure? And yet at the same time, we seem to have confidence and trust in someone who doesn't ask us to do something that he himself is not willing to do. The worst boss in the world is one that gives orders but offers very little help or doesn't lead by example. Some of you probably work for bosses like that. I have. Uh, the opening scene in the movie Patton, George C. Scott played General Patton. He's giving a speech to the Third Army and uh, from what I read, that that speech was simply, or that script was compiled from different speeches Patton had given over a period of time. And they created that scene where he's in in standing in front of the giant American flag speaking to his troops. And he concludes that speech by saying, by the way, I'll be happy to lead you wonderful guys into battle anytime, anywhere. Sixty-five years later, some old 90-year-old World War II vet who had served in the Third Army of General George S. Patton would have told you that was the proudest achievement of his life, to follow a man who wasn't afraid to, to go ahead and lead them right into battle. And um, they were proud to have done so. And they would boast that I served under George Patton. I met a man just like that who told me in as much the same, the same thing. But the New Testament tells us, we have not, for we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. The Lord Jesus went before you to win a victory that you could not win on your own. He was tempted by Satan. He was re rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. He was refused by his own family members. He was abandoned by his disciples. He was mocked by the crowds. He was forsaken by the Father. Father, uh, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet, without sin, he's called the captain of of your salvation, Hebrews 2, verse 10. If he endured all those things and endured the pain of this life and the tragedies of uh, being forsaken and abandoned by his dearest, uh, closest friends and family members, uh, if he suffered a horrific death and torturous death for the sake of the glory that was laid ahead of him without sin, so should you be able to. And I got to say, your life and my life are nothing compared to the life the Lord Jesus Christ lived and the death he suffered for our sake. Most of us are going to die comfortable in our own beds or in a hospital bed under great, uh, wonderful medical care one day. But not the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he suffered all of those things, yet without sin, without complaining that this was not fair, this was not right, God... Uh, I changed my mind. I don't want to do it. Without any of that, then what do you and I have to complain about? He goes before you to lead the way. You might know his victory in this wicked and, and rotten world. And your God is above you. He's around you. And he's before you. Fourthly, David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, verse 6. 
Point number four, where is thy God? God is behind you. God is behind you. Exodus 14, verse 19 tells us, The angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. God intervened, and he, he blocked Pharaoh's army from advancing on the children of Israel in the middle of the night as they were pursuing them. And by the Lord, you know, by the Lord covering your back, he's trying to run interference and keep your bad mistakes, your sins, your rotten friends from your unsaved days from messing up your testimony in this life now. And he's also trying to put up a wall so you don't look back and stare at those things over and over again, saying, gosh, I sure missed the good old days. Forget the good old days. The good old days are what were taking you to hell. There's a double blessing with God being behind you. You say someone's got my back, they mean that they're protecting me. They don't want something sneaking up on me and catching me from behind. But we read, forgetting those things which are behind, uh, which were behind, and reaching forth those things which are before, Philippians 3.13. You're not the same man anymore. You're not the same woman anymore now that you've trusted Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17. So God is above you. God is around you. God is before you. God is behind you. Point number five, the Bible says, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. Point number five, where is thy God? Your God is beneath you. Underneath you. We sing leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. God is holding you up. God's sustaining you. God's supporting you. You know, <clears throat> remember a few years ago, there was that, that TV show called Fear Factor. And uh, there was one great episode. There was one Korean girl, and they were asking him to eat some kind sort of yuck, gobbledygook junk, you know. And the Korean girl said, I'm Korean. I eat anything. We eat anything. <laughs> but uh, for $50,000, uh, nobody wants to crawl on a little, small little uh, board or a, or a beam between two skyscrapers unless there is a safety net down below. You've got to have a safety net, maybe a harness, to keep you from falling uh, uh, quickly to the net, even. And um, <clears throat> even a professional tightrope walker in a circus has a, a net down below. At least if he's a smart one, he's a smart acrobat. There was a guy named George Blondin many, many years ago. When I was uh, 15 years old, my parents took us on a trip. We went back to Niagara Falls. And in a little museum, there was a a, a wheelbarrow that George Blondin used to push on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. No net. And I forget when that was, the 1920s, 1930s, but he would push bricks in the wheelbarrow and then come back safe and sound. And he asked the crowd, how many of you think I could carry a man across the tightrope? And they'd all say, yeah, we all think you could. All right, who wants to volunteer? Nobody would volunteer. Nobody was getting that wheelbarrow with George Blondin. But the net gives people courage. The net gives them confidence. It gives them just enough boost and, and, and decision that, that they might be able to do something because there's a safety net below. If you knew that there's nothing you could do to lose your salvation... No matter what mistakes you make in this life, no matter what sins you commit, there's not a, a way in the world that you could ever lose your salvation. Would it impel you to try something more for God, to do something for Jesus' sake? Would it encourage you to try and be a better testimony or win some soul to Jesus Christ before this life was over? I certainly hope it would. <coughs> Jude, verse 24, concludes, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God is ready to catch you if you should stumble, if you should fall in your Christian walk. So he's above you. He is around you. He's before you. He's behind you. And he's beneath you. Point number six. Jesus told his disciples, Lo, 
I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, verse 20. Where is thy God? Well, for a believer in Jesus Christ, your God is right beside you. He's beside you. Amos 3, verse 3 asks, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Obviously, the answer is no. When you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to become your Savior, you and God came into agreement about something. You both agreed that you were lost. <laughs> you both agreed that you needed to be forgiven, that you needed to be born again, that you needed what only he could offer you. Paul writes that at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2, verses 12 and 13. Christ is walking beside you every step of the way in this life. You're never alone. You're never abandoned. There's never any time when God's uh, out taking a coffee break and left you all alone. It doesn't happen. Now, you might forsake him. You might be indifferent towards him. You might stop reading your Bible. You might stop praying. You might, not, you might stop being with other Christians as you ought to be. And you might say, well, I can be a Christian and you know, I'll, I'll catch up with my Bible reading next week. You might do that towards him, but he never does that towards you. He's with you all the time. He's above you, around you, before you, behind you, beneath you, and beside you. And lastly, point number seven, Christ promised the Holy Spirit would come. And he said, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he, shall, he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. John 14, verse 17. Where is thy God, Christian? He's within you. He's within you. I'm so glad I asked Christ to come in, uh, in, into me and live when I was a six-year-old boy. All I could pray was, God, forgive me. I knew I was a sinner, and I didn't know what words to say, but I prayed, God, forgive me. And all of these other things were taking place inside me right at that moment. God was forgiving me of my sin. He was writing my name in heaven. The Holy Spirit was coming into me to live from that moment until this very moment. And uh, little by little, I've gained the assurance that God will never leave me nor forsake me, but he'll be with me all the way, even unto the end of the world. And there's nothing I can do to undo his salvation. Think about that. There's nothing you can do to undo the salvation he's wrought by saving you by Jesus Christ. The Apostle John later writes, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. Uh, He does not dwell within the unbeliever. And only if Christ is in you... Do all those other factors apply? Beside you, before you, beneath you, above you, and so forth. None of those things apply to the unbeliever. They only apply to the Christian. And once Jesus Christ comes into you by faith, by salvation, by the new birth, all of those other relationships to God suddenly become yours. The moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit of God came inside you. And he awakened your dead spirit to the things of God. He lives inside you. He gives you new life. By his abiding presence in you, you begin to discover a relationship with God that you never imagined before. Suddenly the Bible be takes on a new importance to you. Suddenly you can't get enough of the word of God. And uh, where is thy God? Well, he's above you, around you, before you, behind you, beneath you, beside you. And he's within you. And I'm going to try to wrap this up. Uh, David could say, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Psalm 139, verse 7. When God seems to be distant from you, when he seems to hide himself from you, don't think like the unbeliever thinks and say, Well, where is your so-called great God? Think God is closer to me than, I've ever, than he's ever been before. You know, when you disobey and your, your dad, maybe sometimes your mom, but your dad has to spank you. Dr. Ruckman used to illustrate it this way. Um, he'd say when, when 
your father was spanking you, and uh, you try to you try to get away from him. He's got a long. He's got his full arms reach. It hits you even harder. He said so. So the thing to do when God's spanking you and disciplining you is to get in real close. That way he has to hit down like this, and the, <laughs> and the spanking doesn't hurt as badly. And when things are going badly for you, and it seems like you're facing some some incredible, unbelievable problem, that's the time to realize how good God is and get as close to him as you can. 